Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today, we speak with two guests who strive daily to resist fear and embrace the plan God has for their lives with willing hearts, Melanie Shankle and Marshawn Evans Daniels. Melanie Shankle is a writer and a speaker who has learned to recognize how God wants to move us beyond the limits we place on ourselves. She discusses how important it is to recognize how much bigger God is than our fears and what we are capable of in His strength. My name is Melanie Shankel. I'm a writer and a speaker. I live in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I've been married to my husband, Perry, for 20 years, and we have a 14-year-old daughter, Caroline, who's a high school freshman. Um, I've written four books and now a devotional book, and so those are Sparkly Green Earrings, The Antelope in the Living Room, Nobody's Cuter Than You, um, Church of the Small Things, and my new devotional is a 100-day devotional called Everyday Holy. I grew up in Houston, Texas, for the most part, ended up going to high school in Beaumont, Texas. Um, My parents got divorced when I was eight years old, and so my childhood definitely had some tumultuous moments, um, just kind of a lot of moving around and a lot of moving parts. And so for me, I feel like just to um, kind of recognize my value in God's eyes, that, that to me has been a lifelong struggle, and I can trace that back to my childhood. Um, and kind of the way I grew up, um, I think sometimes when the people who are supposed to love you the most don't or can't, it leaves you feeling kind of this void. Um, and it's very much made me a people pleaser where I want everybody to like me. You know, I want everybody to be happy. Um, and so in in high school, I really went through, through high school and college, I went through this series is um, just kind of, I'd grown up in the church, but just really rebelled and kind of went away from everything I'd ever known. And I think that left me with so much like guilt and shame, um, even as I came out of that, where I just felt like I was beyond what God could use, you know, like he couldn't, I had made too many mistakes and, um, and I didn't think that there was, he could you know, I felt like, sure, he could forgive me. You know, we kind of do this thing. We quantify it as humans. Like, well, sure, he can forgive me, but he's not going to actually bless my life with good things because I don't deserve those because I've screwed up so much. That was a long journey, you know, of 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 being able to walk out of that. And a, and a lot of healing had to take place. And, um, and it took a long time. I mean, I just don't think that's an instantaneous thing. And I think it's so you're so quick to go back to that spot, you know, like when you fail or when you mess up, as we're inevitably going to do you're still going to make mistakes. And then you would go back to that. Oh, this is why I don't deserve nice things. You know, this is why I can't have nice things because I screw them up, <laughs> you know? And so it, it's that whole thing. You know, I don't mean to go all church lady with Satan, but I do think I'm like, we don't know what we're capable of, but I absolutely believe that we have an enemy that knows what we're capable of. And I think that he is aware of what God could do with a person who is fully surrendered and trust in what God has for them. And if we would quit believing those lies, I think there's no limit to what God can do through us. I mean, so it doesn't catch God by surprise when we screw up, but that he still says, I delight in you. I sing over you. I have your name engraved on the palms of my hands. You think that's that's a God who loves you no matter what. And I think that we put our human limitations on that. So for me, um, kind of the stabilizing force of my life was really when my mom moved um, my sister and I to Beaumont, Texas, when I was in seventh grade. And at that point, we lived down the street from her parents. And then my dad's parents lived across town. And so my grandparents really became um, a, a big force in my life in terms of kind of shaping um who I am and and what's important to me and all of that stuff, just to see the way that they faithfully lived out their lives. You know, the thing that I look at when I think back on them is how much they love their family, like as different as they were. Um, you know, my dad came from this big Italian family. Um, my grandmother had eight brothers and sisters that all lived within two blocks of her her entire life. Um, So you had that and they were loud and there was always food and they hugged you and kissed you on the mouth, whether you knew them or not was kind of their personality. Um, And then you had my mom's family, which was different. I mean, they were, they were quieter. They were from the panhandle of Texas, probably more reserved, just a little different. But to me, what they both prioritized and what I saw was it was family was the most important thing that they absolutely loved their family. They 
love their friends. They just invested in life right around them. And just so there were always people, no matter which house I was at, where you had friends and family coming through the door and they welcomed them with open arms and there was always food on the table. And I definitely can look back and think I remember feeling safe, that when I was with them, I felt safe. I knew that I was loved. I knew that I was adored. I knew that they were going to take care of me. And that definitely, you know, even though I probably couldn't have put a name on it, I knew I knew that feeling and, and appreciated that feeling even as a kid. I look back and I always love writing. Like I, I love to write stories. One of my, one of the memories that stands out to me is in fourth grade. I remember we had to write a creative story um, and read it in front of the class. And my teacher had me read mine in front of the class and it made the whole class laugh. And I remember like a light went on where it was like, oh, this is something I can do. You know, like this, I have maybe found a gift. And, you know, at the time you don't really know what that is, but I was like, oh, I really like this. And so, um, So that kind of went from writing funny little stories to always had a diary where I was writing thoughts and feelings. And then, you know, you go through those junior high years where I wrote a lot of really dramatic poetry um, that would probably make me cringe now. But to me, it was always writing. That was what I loved. I loved English. I loved reading anything I could get my hands on. Um, That's always been who I am. And so then when I got to, I went to Texas A&M. And so when I got there, I basically chose my major based on what required the least amount of math classes. And that happened to be speech communications. So I ended up majoring in speech communications at Texas A&M, which there again gave me the chance to, and minored in journalism. So that gave me the chance to to write and to speak, um, which is so funny looking back because you know, you don't really, your career aspiration is, I think I want to be a writer and a speaker because that is kind of like saying, I think I want to live in my parents' basement forever and never, you know, I never want to make any real money. I ended up getting a job in San Antonio and moved to San Antonio. I was doing financial sales. Um, So I always say, if I look like somebody who evaluated your financial portfolio between the years of like 1994 to 1997, you may want to go get that checked out again. I I apologize profusely. Uh, I believe that I had made a D in personal finance at Texas A&M, and then somehow I got this job in financial planning. So um, that was my job. And so I was working in a hospital, and I was living by myself. And um, and Perry and I, my husband, we just really started off as friends, and we were just great friends for about six months before we realized, like, oh, I think maybe this has become something else. You know, it's so funny looking back because I started the blog in July of 2006, which, you know, I know it wasn't, you know, the dawn of the internet, but looking back now, that kind of feels like it was the dawn of the internet. You know, I mean, you just think there was no, I mean, adults weren't really on Facebook yet. There was no Twitter. There was no Instagram. There was none of that. It was just blogs. And so for me, I was at the time I had been in pharmaceutical sales Um, For about 10 years, I'd transitioned into pharmaceutical sales. And then I had my daughter, Caroline, in 2003. And while I was on maternity leave with her, I kind of discovered blogs because I was looking for, you know, you spend a lot of time as a new mom Googling, like, how do I know my baby's doing the right thing? Or how do you make your baby sleep at night or whatever? And that led me to stumble upon what I guess were the first mommy blogs at the time. And I loved them. And so I I got into reading them. And the whole time I kept thinking, I think I could do this. Like, this is a good outlet. And so right before Caroline turned three, I, one night on a whim, just because she was at that age, if you're a parent, where she was saying all these funny things and we had all these funny things happen. And I thought, I'm never going to be a scrapbooker and I'm never going to be together enough to actually order the pictures off Shutterfly to put them in an album. So what if I start this blog where I just write about our life and our day? And so that's what I did. I started it. I named it Big Mama, which I really regret now because I didn't know it was going to be a lasting thing or I would have maybe thought about that name a little bit more. Um, But at the time, it seemed real funny and appropriate. That was it. And so I started it and it really became like my creative lifeline that kind of brought me back to what I love to do. I felt like in those early days, it was more of us really being our real authentic selves and sharing our struggles 
with motherhood and with life and and with all of those things. And I feel like in a lot of ways now the internet has turned to, I need you to all see how fabulous my life is, you know? And it's, and I think we kind of do this fake authenticity thing like, oh, y'all wouldn't believe, look, I left a curler in my hair today when I went to, but I don't think we're maybe digging as deep. Um, and, and I don't know that that's across the board, but I just feel like with these, you know, I think about fashion blogs where you just think you need everything to look perfect at all times, you know, because that's how you're going to get people to buy the clothes that you're featuring. Or you're, if it's a home blog, you need it to look great. Your house needs to always be fixed and styled and, and ready. And that's just, it's, so it's a different, we're seeing a different view of people than maybe sometimes the real thing that's going on. I mean, now you could look at any given time and see all the things that people are doing. And so much of it is stuff that you would never be aware of without social media. You know, you wouldn't know that somebody has just started a church or adopted a child from Africa or started some incredible like nonprofit ministry or whatever it is that people are doing. But now we constantly are bombarded by, oh, well, this person's doing this and this person's doing that. And that was really, I mean, truthfully, you know, I've always said that when I write my books or like whatever God is doing in my heart is kind of what becomes what I write or speak on during that season. You know, it's like what I'm wrestling with and what God's teaching me. And so, you know, Church of the Small Things was the was the book that I wrote because of my own struggles with am I supposed to be doing something bigger than this, you know, or, or why am I not doing something bigger than this? Why hasn't God chosen me to do this big thing or put on my heart? And a lot of where I would lay awake at night and be like, am I supposed to adopt a child from Africa? You know, like I would feel this pressure. Am I supposed to start this thing? Am I supposed to, you know, be out making this huge difference? And I just kept coming back to, it was funny because to circle back to like thinking about my grandparents, I just kept coming back to them um, and thinking about what a difference they made in their family going forward and the legacy they left just by loving and living in their everyday world. We have this little sphere of influence that may seem insignificant, but I believe so strongly, and God kept bringing me back to, I put you here for a reason. Like, I made you the wife to this husband and the mother to this child and in this community that you're in for a reason and a purpose. And so if I want to try to change the world, you start within the walls of your house, you know, and that it doesn't have to be this, you don't go from point A to point Z, you know, there's there's steps along the way. And that ultimately, as Christians, it's like, what if the biggest thing God calls us to do is just to wake up in the morning and go, what do you have for me to do today? Like, show me what you have for me today, whatever that is. And that ultimately, if that's supposed to be some big thing, he's going to lead you to that. But a lot of times, even if we get this vision for something and think, oh, I think God is going to have me here. You know, how many times even in the Bible do you see where God uh, where God says, I'm going to have you here. And then you see like 30 years later, that person is actually there. You know, it's a long, slow steps of faithfulness that usually lead us to the bigger things that God has for us. Melanie goes on to talk about writing her new devotional, Every Day Holy. She also discusses how the Jesus Calling devotional has been a beloved part of her own personal devotion time writing the devotional, as much as I love it now that it's a finished product, it was the hardest thing I've written. Um, it, like, it, here's what I'm going to say, like, kudos to Jesus Calling in 365 days, because, I, I mean, I got to like day 50, and I really had this moment where I thought, well, I've said everything there is to say in the Bible. You know, like, there's like, I've covered it all. <laughs> there's not a story left to be told, because it was so hard, but it was like anything that you try to do. I was trying to finish it and power through in my own strength. And the devotional really came back to, I couldn't just rely on like being funny or being able to write a good story. It was like, I really had to rely on God to kind of give me the words and the message and to put things on my heart that I felt like were supposed to be in that book. Um, and so I can look back at it now that it's a finished product and go, wow, that's amazing what God did with that and, and the way he gave me the words. I couldn't get through it on my own strength. It's like, I really needed God to to speak to me and which is so appropriate that it becomes this everyday holy because it really is about going back to God for the source of everything of what do you have for me today um so that was kind of how the devotional came to be i've tried to think back to when i first 
knew about Jesus Calling. I just remember a lot of friends having it. You know, it kind of became one of these where everybody's like, oh, I'm doing this Jesus Calling devotional. Oh, have you heard of Jesus Calling? And I was like, no. And so I picked it up. Here's what I love about Jesus Calling is it really is one, and it's so... Um, I think the way that Sarah wrote it, the way God led her to write it is there are so many people, and I even see it on like my Facebook feed. I laugh where it's like, whatever it is you're needing that day, it seems like it always works out with Jesus calling where you're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed today. You know, there were, there have been so many times, um, because I feel like that's just become one of my standard devotionals. Like even if I'm doing something else, I always start my day with Jesus calling, and so when you when you read those words and you're just like wow this was this I'm, I've been struggling with anxiety today and this was exactly what I needed to read this morning to remember and it just shows how really as humans we all struggle and deal with the same things over and over again and it's you know you look at God and you think when He created us it's like that He the things that He's saying to Sarah are the things that he is saying to all of us and just how they resonate in our lives, you know, just whether we're dealing with fear or worry or feeling like we're not enough or, you know, wondering if he's still good, even in the midst of trials. That's what kept coming up as I wrote my devotional. And I kept thinking, is this because this is a universal thing or is like, because I feel like anxiety and fear is one of my biggest things. I tell this little joke in my devotional that I saw somewhere where it was like that, um, God told the angels, he's like, look, I've created man. And what the angels responded was, what you've done is mess up a perfectly good monkey. Look how anxious and fearful that thing is. And I'm like, that has made me laugh so hard because I'm like, we are, we're so anxious and fearful. It goes back to that is a message that so many of us need to hear is that God created us for a purpose and has plans for us and that He gave us all these special gifts and that ours aren't going to look like somebody else's, you know, that we've got to find our unique purpose and that that exists. I think there's no limit to what God can do through us because I think that every time we believe those lies, we wrap ourselves back up in that fear and that insecurity and that feeling that we're not good enough. And I think we have a God that is so big that He's like, you never outrun my love and grace. And you, there's not one thing you could do or have done or will ever do that will disqualify you from what I can do with you and for what what I created you for and and you just look and go I mean it's it's in the bible over and over again like every good gift comes from God like he so wants to give us good and the thing about it is is from the dawn of time from the minute Adam and Eve were on the earth we proved that we were going to screw up our nice things I mean so it doesn't catch God by surprise when we screw up but that he still says, I delight in you. I sing over you. I have your name engraved on the palms of my hands. You think that's that's a God who loves you no matter what. God's just like, okay, that's let's start over. New day, you know? Um, and I think if we lived in that truth, I think that we're unstoppable. And I think it goes back to that it's it's I think that we have an enemy that knows that if he can if he can continue to feed us that, that we'll that we'll stay in this little small space and we won't really branch out into all that God has for us. I think it's just to me, you just look and go, I always think about it, it's like when 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 Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead and he walked out and he was like, Take off your grave clothes. And I think that's it. We've got to take off our grave clothes. You know, we've got to say, This is the dead in me and it is gone. And I think you, you look at God with fresh eyes. Um, and I, I, I think never underestimate what God can do with a willing heart. To read more from Melanie Shankle, visit her site at thebigmamablog.com and find her new devotional, Everyday Holy, Finding a Big God in the Little Moments, everywhere books are sold. We'll be back with our second guest after this brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Want a daily reminder that we can have hope, peace, and joy each day in Jesus? Now it's as easy as opening an email. The Jesus Calling Daily Email brings you a thought from the Jesus Calling family of devotionals every day. Brighten up your inbox with this little reminder and take a minute to connect with God during your day. To sign up to get your free daily thought from Jesus Calling, please visit jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. That's jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. Our next guest is Marshawn Evans Daniels. Marshawn was the picture of success, a Miss America pageant finalist, a participant on the TV show The Apprentice, and the founder of a highly successful sports firm. Her world came down the day before her dream wedding when she found out her fiancé was cheating on her. 
She shares what she calls a split rock moment in her life, where God was preparing her for a whole new future she could never have imagined. I am Marshawn Evans Daniels, a reinvention strategist, life catalyst, founder of the Godfidence Movement, and author of Believe Bigger, Discover the Path to Your Life Purpose. I help women of faith increase their uh, walk with God, their income, and also their influence in the marketplace. I grew up in the suburbs of North Dallas. My mom and dad were first generation career professionals. Both sets of my grandparents grew up in the Deep South um, during a time where they didn't have a lot of educational opportunity. And so my grandparents mostly cleaned homes and buildings for other people, but they were very passionate about education. And so my mom went on to be one of the first in her family to go to college. My dad didn't go to college, but he uh, made a career for himself in the Federal Aviation Administration as one of the first African American air traffic controllers. So both my parents were kind of trailblazers in Social Security and in Federal Aviation, and they were very passionate about my brother and I having every opportunity that we could to succeed and to thrive. And they moved us into the suburbs of North Dallas during the early 80s. And it was a wonderful home life in terms of having both parents learning about who God was as a young girl. Even though it was the 80s, for my school, my brother and I were two of maybe three or five black kids in the whole school. So it felt like integration for the first time for us. And it was for a lot of the teachers, even though it was the 80s. So a lot of um, labeling and being called a problem child, I adopted the rule book that if I am successful, then I will be accepted. And then that determines my worth and my validation. So that's why I got good grades, not because I even cared about what I was learning. I didn't want to be rejected. I didn't want to embarrass my family. I didn't want to be, at least if I could get some attention, it would be attention for thriving. My upbringing, it was very much very loving at home, but I also developed a very strong addiction to success. I was a competitive baton twirler. I went on to compete at the Miss America competition and I'm legally blind in my left eye. So doctor said it would really be impossible for me to be able to much less be a baton twirler versus a competitive baton twirl on an international scale. I, and and, that's, and I, w- I ended up being international two baton champion. And I remember being on the competition floor reciting Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, so this was something that, an understanding that we can do what we are here to do and that there are no limits uh, with who Christ is. That's really where I learned to believe bigger at a very early age. And I'm grateful for the example that my parents set in being trailblazers because you know, being minorities in the time that they have, you know, when they had opportunity in America, it takes a lot of faith to believe past stereotypes and barriers and to pass that on to us without um, causing us to think small, but teaching us at a very early age to believe bigger, but not just to only believe in ourselves, but to believe that all things truly are possible through Christ, who's the one who gives us strength. I went to Georgetown University for law school, had the opportunity to go to compete at Miss America, was third runner up to Miss America, and also started a sports agency, managing pro athletes in the NFL and the NBA. And I had this vision of being this sports agency that was Christian based, woman owned, and we were just going to be the biggest thing on the planet and really reinvent how athlete representation was done. And I wanted to bring my law degree, bring my faith. And so I wanted to put it all together in this sports agency. And when I started to feel a little bit of a tug saying, you know what, I think it's time for you to pause. And I felt the Holy Spirit really leading me in that direction. And I was confused because I really had only been been in this space a few years. I was a baby lawyer, only practicing two years. I'd been off the show, The Apprentice, just a little while, had all these great opportunities. And I was set that, God, this is what you told me to do. So this is what we're doing. I put the money into the office. I've built it out. I've got a staff. What do you mean it's time to rest, to pause, to to pull back? And also during that time, I was engaged, engaged to um, a man in in a different state. So we were traveling, having a long distance relationship. um, And I was becoming, getting ready to become a bonus mom to his three kids. And on top of the business, 
the uh, relationship. I was also traveling with a book that I had at the time about women being successful in their careers and having confidence in their careers. And so this just seemed like a really odd time for God to be saying pause as opposed to grow. But um, we were a few days out from our wedding. Um, it was a dream wedding. I felt like I had met my Prince Charming. And then um, the morning of the day that my fiance was my fiance was scheduled to come into the city for, for wedding week. <laughs> this was six days before. It was a Monday morning. I remember it very well. I got a message um, that completely shocked me and changed my life and really split me wide open. And I discovered that he was cheating on me. And uh, I didn't believe it at first. I wasn't sure if this was true. Of course, you go through all of the different range of emotions. It was absolutely devastating. But it was really also an awakening for me. Um, I learned so much about, one, how you can actually sleepwalk through things. And I had this big plan. I had this vision for my life. And I was felt like I was following the vision that God gave me. But what I realized later, and, you know, it was a difficult process to not only just call the wedding off, to break off, because there's a wedding and then there's the engagement. The wedding is just an event. The engagement is the relationship and all of the decisions that needed to now be unmade from the wedding dresses were paid for, the venue is paid for, the pastor and the, the, the spiritual advisors, everybody's is set. And a lot of people couldn't get their money back. I talked to a lot of women who said it was very brave for me to call off the wedding. And I felt like it was grace. One of the things I write about in, um, in Believe Bigger is how grace, we often think of it as this soft and fluffy and pretty thing. But really, it is what equips us for battle. It's like the full armor of God that covers us and shields us from things that we don't even know we're not capable to handle within our own strength. So these moments where we have disruption, so many times we want to run away from the pain. We want to run away from obstacles. Or we even think that we're under attack by the enemy. And when we understand that grace is really equipping us for battle, and sometimes that's what grace has to do to protect a larger mission and a larger plan that God knows, and he's got to do whatever it needs to do to keep that sacred and safe. And so that was the beginning, though, of me reinventing how, uh, to another level, my walk with God, reinventing my the way I approached life and success and I wanted to figure out how did I end up here? How did I end up sleepwalking when I've walked with God my whole life? I and I teach and I teach the Bible. I how do I end up in a position? How did I end up with this man? How did I end up in this place? Why am I here? And it was through asking that question that I discovered elevated levels that were available for me to enter with God but also for a greater mission that he wanted me to step into as well. Part of the reason why it's so necessary and why I've written this uh, message about believing bigger. It's not just about believing for a bigger blessing. It's about believing bigger about who God needs you to be in this season, what he wants from you. Because to, for us to step into our life mission and our purpose, we're going to face opposition and resistance. And the disruption is usually the doorway into the greater destiny. And what I found through infidelity of being faced with something that I didn't think I would ever encounter. What I've discovered is in Isaiah 48, 21, um, it talks about what, what I now call split rock moments. And this scripture was one of the things that really helped to me to understand that this did not happen to me, that this, as hard as it could be to understand, really did happen for me. But because of what was within me and something new that God was trying to do through me. And I said, God, where are you sending me now? That helped me to have context to begin to understand maybe this wasn't about what happened, but about where I needed to go. Because in Isaiah 48, 21, it says, they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. And the scripture captivated me while I'm in, basically in the bed every day, in a place of depression, staring at the ceiling, not sure 
again, how did I end up here? Certainly feeling like a desert season. And I had been having this, these, 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 I kept seeing the words deserts everywhere. So this scripture was like an oasis in the middle of a desert. When the scripture said he led them through the deserts, I was like, is it possible, God, that you led me here? Like, this is where you need me right now? Because we think, why would God take us to a desert? I'm your daughter. Why, why would you put me in the desert? And then it goes on and it says he made water flow for them from the rock. So I'm like, okay, how is this possible? They're in a desert, but they're not thirsty. God led them into the desert, but then he made water flow for them from the rock. I don't know a lot of rocks that have a lot of water on the inside. And so I I remember being in college and taking geology, but that's not something that I remember being a common principle, maybe some moisture, but not massive reservoirs of water. And then it said he split the rock and water gushed out. And it was in that moment, it just really resonated with me. I probably studied the scripture for a full day and then meditated and sat with it for weeks. And what I realized is that if God split the rock, that maybe the disruption, what I was facing was what I now call a split rock moment because there's something on the inside that's waiting to burst out. It says the water gushed out and it's been trying to get out. And maybe the only way God could get that new life because that's what water symbolizes. And so that was what really began my true awakening. I would say the disruption happened the moment I got the message that my fiance was cheating on me. It was a surrender to say, not just why, but where, where are you leading me, God? I know that my life is not my own. Teach me. You have my attention. If I have been distracted by success and by busyness, God, I lay it all down and you've stripped it all away. So here I am. I don't, have any animosity towards my ex-fiance now. I did before. (laughs) That's the human, honest response. And it took me some years. It took me some time. But the less I focused on him, the more I focused on what God wanted me to understand. But really, where did he want me to go? Because where God wants us to go in our lives will be indicative of where he wants to grow you inside of you because he everything about our life is about our purpose it's about our assignment it's about our mission like salvation is just getting in the game like once we're once we're once we're followers of Christ that's just the beginning there's a whole bunch of other stuff that he has put inside of us for us to accomplish for us to do for us to execute to be his hands to be his feet and to be his heartbeat here and so where does god want me to go i have a conversation with god and i ask the question I didn't word it perfectly at the time of, God, why did this happen to me is, is, were the exact words that I said. But in my heart, I was like, where are you going with this? Like, I need, and I needed to know. I didn't care what, what, who was around. I just, and he, he very gently said, and very clearly and swiftly, you are going to be able to change the lives of women like never before. So this is the day after my wedding. Now I'm working with athletes. I'm working mostly with men. All of my mentors are men. I am used to being around the guys. And I was one of those women who said, I don't really get along well with women. And that's not really my thing. And what God was doing, he was showing me a place that I needed to grow. I needed to have more empathy to have the ability to step into my assignment. Our, Our divine assignment isn't usually attached to what our perceived strengths are. They're attached to our weaknesses where we think we're not good enough, where we don't want to go. And our purpose is often hidden inside of a place of pain. That's the split rock moment. The new life is hidden in the hard place. So the place I didn't want to go is where he's saying that day after I was supposed to have said I do or scheduled to have said I do, he said, you're going to go to the very place that you think you would never want to go, ever want to go. And that's working with women. If we're not anchored in what God wants from us, he will split rock our world until he gets us where he needs us because there's something that is from him that only lives within us. And that is what he will use any means necessary to allow to break out and gush out. God's been giving me these dreams, his vision, sometimes for a lifetime, for decades. And they're like, finally, I found somebody who is not just about business, but believes in the full gospel from um, Genesis to Revelation and is teaching it together. And so it it wasn't intentional, but it was just, I took one step and it has evolved into 
was the largest coaching company for women of faith in the country. And so as I worked with women day in and day out through our coaching programs, our conferences that have grown, that first event had 35. Now we have you know, several hundred, 500 women that'll be in a room for business and faith. And we have worship together while we're learning about business, branding, marketing, and sales. I was able to, I believe, step into a bigger vision for what I was doing in my purpose that gave me an understanding. I don't have to strive anymore. And then I could start praying for what I call now purpose partner that would be aligned with this new version, this higher version of me that was who I was always being led into. I am married to an amazing man. He is a hoot. I also call him my playmate because he just loves to have fun. Um, He is a therapist by trade. And he has taught me so much about what he calls dumping. And I think a lot of us who are helpers don't get trained in this and understand that you can't carry everything that you're helping people with. And so we, we like amusement parks and superhero movies and just fun stuff. And we make it a point to laugh, to go on vacations together. One of my good girlfriends who was a maid of honor in my wedding, who's been like a big sister to me now for almost 20 years, she sent me a, a screenshot of this devotional she was reading. And she and I have been such good friends. For her to say that this was a devotional she was reading with her husband really stood out to me that he was taking the time to stop his busy life to do this with her. And so that was the first time I learned about Jesus Calling. And so it really spoke to me before I read it because she said they were doing it together and then she wanted to share a particular passage with me and that it was really speaking to both of them in the mornings that they were doing their study time or reading time together. Jesus Calling is a book that I have gifted to um, several other people. The most special person though that I've given it to is my mother. And you know, my mom is um, very dear to me. Um, I wasn't actually sure I was going to be able to do this interview today because I was possibly going to get back on a plane to go to the hospital to see um, if she was being taken back in today. Um, And what I asked her, though, this morning um, when I talked to her, I got to FaceTime her, so I saw that she was doing well, and I said, we're on standby. We'll come soon if we need to. I asked her, I said, did you read your Jesus Calling today? And when I left... um, Dallas a few days ago, I made sure that she knew where it was. And the reason I mention that is when you have one of the most precious people in the world and you want to give them what you feel is the best thing that will keep their faith, that will um, keep them assured that they, she is covered by all of heaven right in this moment. The only thing that I thought about was giving her Jesus calling. It is the only thing that I trusted to put into her hands that a Bible can be a lot to hold on to in a, in a hospital because it can be thick and it can be heavy. It's a lot of, you don't know which page to turn to. So the level of care that went into that, it is just dripping. I believe it is um, something that is going to live for forever. And it was the only thing that I trusted to put into my mom's hands. And it's also what helped guide, really confirm for me that even in this purpose walk of like, what is our specific assignment? Giving people what I call these simple prayers to pray um, and purpose prayers, giving them guided language. And so I'm very grateful to Sarah for um, being surrendered and being on the path that she was with God to allow such an amazing compass to navigate so many of our lives. To find out more about Marshawn's book, Dream Bigger, Discover the Path to Your Life Purpose, visit her website at marshawn.com. Next week on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with the members of Point of Grace, the Dove Award and Grammy Award winning contemporary Christian group. They speak to us about their new release, a collection of hymns and worship songs entitled Beautiful Name. This hymns record for us is again another opportunity to bring about songs that are so rich and are so strong um, just in in their theology Mm -hmm. and and hymns bar none are those and so to keep the millennials 
embraced, <laughs> doing a little bit of that modern worship was a nice compliment. And so it was just, it was time. This week's featured passage comes from the April 19th entry of the Jesus Calling audiobook. I love you regardless of how well you are performing. Sometimes you feel uneasy, wondering if you're doing enough to be worthy of my love. No matter how exemplary your behavior, the answer to that question will always be no. Your performance and my love are totally different issues which you need to sort out. I love you with an everlasting love that flows out from eternity without limits or conditions. I have clothed you in my robe of righteousness, and this is an eternal transaction. Nothing and no one can reverse it. Therefore, your accomplishment as a Christian has no bearing on my love for you. Even your ability to assess how well you are doing on a given day is flawed. Your limited human perspective and the condition of your body with its mercurial variations distort your evaluations. Bring your performance anxiety to me and receive in its place my unfailing love. Try to stay conscious of my loving presence with you in all that you do, and I will direct your steps. Do you love hearing great stories of faith each week via the Jesus Calling podcast? We want to hear from you. If you haven't already subscribed to the Jesus Calling podcast, visit the Jesus Calling page at iTunes.com and hit the subscribe button. While you're there, we'd love for you to leave us a review and tell us how you feel about the show and what future guests you'd love to see. Your reviews and subscription help us share these stories of faith to more people who need the hope and encouragement of Jesus Calling. If you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.